This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, folks, let's get started. Uh, I got uh, the, the mic now, so uh, this is being recorded. All right, all refreshed? Red start a little bit? All right. <laughs> um, so after that introduction, I'm going to um, try to kind of paint a picture around the physical, biological, and chemical uh, processes in soils, just to give you that, sort of that basic level of, of understanding. And I know for some of you, this is very familiar. For others, maybe not. Sometimes it's interesting to see how someone presents the information, right? So I'll start with the, with the physical processes in, in the soil. So one, um, one perhaps most important process, physical process in soil, is the ability of the soil to retain water you know, through capillarity. So the, the soil is like a sponge. And that allows the soil to hold not only water, but to hold the solution that holds the minerals, right? The, the phosphorus, the potassium, and all the, all the minerals. So, um, and that's really that concept of capillarity, that you have particles and that you have water that the soil retains within the particles, is really what allows life on Earth. Um, you know, that allows for the cycling of water between the soil and the, and the atmosphere, okay? Um, so here's a list of you know, some physical properties and processes that are important. Um, I think you're probably familiar with, with, with all of those. So I kind of emphasize this water storage and water movement. Uh, but you don't want too much water because you also need to have air exchange, right? So uh, especially uh, the oxygen needs to go into the soil, but you also need to get rid of the carbon dioxide uh, that comes from, from respiration. Otherwise, you get problems. Um, Actually, the, uh, I'm not sure whether people know this, but the, the, the Biosphere Project in Arizona where they built this big dome and they tried to have a self-sustaining unit. And, um, and that was basically ended up being a failure. And the reason was that they had forgotten about soil respiration. They'd forgotten that there's a lot of carbon dioxide that comes out of the soil. And so they had this controlled dome and the carbon dioxide level started to build up and build up and build up. And at some point in time, the people that were living there had to, had to get out. Uh, so that was a little oversight, uh, but it did show the importance of soils, right? So They didn't get the what? Right, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so, so in general, um, about 50% of, of the typical soil is, is mineral matter, it's particles, roughly, okay? Uh, it's kind of interesting because when you look at soil, you think that you look in only at the, at the mineral part, but there's also water and air and organic material, right? So it's not all minerals, but roughly 50%. Uh, the organic material is, um, you know, it depends. You know, it can be 2%, can be 5%, something like that. Um, and then the air in the water is the one that's very dynamic, right? So... If it rains, you get more water being held in the soil. It may all even become saturated, 100% water in the pores. Uh, and then subsequently, the more air comes in. And so that's the very dynamic component. But you know, it's good to kind of keep in mind, about 50% is mineral particles. So a probably most defining property of the soil, of course, is soil texture. You're all familiar with that, right? Percent sand, silk, and clay, or maybe uh, coarse fragments like rocks. Um, and we classify the soils. So we don't really think of this as necessarily an important component of soil health because it's not a dynamic property. The texture doesn't really change. Um, but it does uh, set the kind of the foundation of the, of, 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 of the health in terms of certain things. So it's, for example, I'm a kind of a taller than average person, right? So that gives me certain capabilities. Maybe I'm a little bit better at playing basketball. And it also gives me say, um, uh, uh, some challenges, like sitting on an airplane, you know. Um, and so you have, you know, certain natural capabilities that are enhanced basically based on the genetics, right? So if you think of the texture as being an inherent genetic property, if it's a clay soil, it's naturally much better at retaining water than a sandy soil. But it's also naturally much worse at, say, transmitting water or infiltrating water, right? 
Um, so, uh, so there's these things that are sort of in inherently predefined by the texture. So we have to pay attention to the, to the texture because it is sort of a defining property that we have to interpret everything else in relationship to. Right? So if we measure, say, the organic carbon content, the organic matter content over soil, which soil holds more organic matter, the clay or the sand? The clay, right? Because it, it creates these bonds between the clay particles and the organic matter. So if you see in a soil with an organic matter of, say, 3%, and it's a clay soil, you say, eh, that's not so good. If it's a sandy soil, that's great, right? So you have to interpret everything relative to, to that. So which soil generally has better aeration, the sand or a clay? Sand, why is that? More large particle of uh, pores, right? Uh, which soil has more, most plant available water? Sand or a clay? A loam, yeah, actually that is the correct answer. That is the correct answer. All right, so, so it's these, these typically these ideal soils tend to be kind of in, in between, right? The, the, the sands are one extreme, they have a lot of large pores, a lot of aeration, uh, and the clays uh, have a lot of very small pores, so a lot of water retention, but they don't have the aeration and the water transmission. And these uh, intermediate, the loams, the silts, are the best. And that's typically what you find also in these confluence areas that we talked about, like the Nile, the Delta, and, and Valley, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, the North China Plain. They're all those intermediate uh, soils. So, as I mentioned, this capillarity is, an, is a key property, right? So the, uh, the fact during, cohe because of cohesive and adhesive forces, you have some water uh, being very tightly held around the particles, and then you have this ability of the water to be held uh, between particles and therefore, you know, hold it against gravity. And so that's really uh, what then allows, if you have, say, a, a matrix of particles, it allows, the water to be held between these particles, and uh, how tightly it's being held is a function of the, the size of the pores, right? So I won't go into details. So the, in this case, this is just a soil of a particular water content. You see that the larger pores have some air in them. Smaller pores are all filled with water. So that's good. You're holding water, so it's available to the plants. But you, you also need some of that air because it needs to be able to breathe, right? So you need, you need both. So, okay, so a, a quick uh, demonstration. So we like to do this, and I always use this slide because how, how many of you know SpongeBob? Right, everybody, so uh, I, yeah, for, it depends a little bit on your age. So I'm way too old for SpongeBob, but my children, we're in the high time of SpongeBob when it was on TV. So I watched a lot of SpongeBob. It's a cartoon, by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with them. It's still on TV. It still is on TV, probably. Yeah, it's really, it's a funny show. But, you know, so I always put this slide up because then every time you see SpongeBob on TV, uh, or maybe every time you take a, take a bath and you have a sponge, you will remember this demonstration, right? <laughs> so, so we have here two, so I have water, and two sponges, right? So what's the difference between these two sponges? The color, okay, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> one, yeah, that's the one. What, what else? One has large pores. Yeah, so this, is, this has large pores and this has mostly small pores, right? And so these are good, you probably, what I'm gonna do, you probably understand this, is nothing new to you, but they, they make for good demonstrations to a more general audience, right? So. This one I say is like a sand, this one is like a compacted clay, right? This has two extremes. And so when you put a sponge in, and everybody knows this, right? You fill it with water, and then of course, the sponge loses a lot of the water because it moves out of the large pores, right? But then it stops after a while, right? So maybe if you give it another 10 seconds or so, it will basically stop losing water. So there's two forces involved here. One is gra the gravity force, which move, wants to move the water out of the sponge. And then there's the retention course, this capillarity, which wants to hold on to the water, right? And so it's the smaller pores that are better at holding on to the water 
than the large pores, right? So now um, this, so this soil, it's really the sponge, is at what we call field capacity. So this happens, say, in the spring or after a major rainfall event, the soil becomes very wet, the water moves through the soil out towards groundwater or whatever, and then it holds on to a certain amount of that water, right? And so this water then becomes available for the plants. Now, is it a good thing that the sponge is losing water? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? why is it a good thing? So there's air in the, in the yeah, exactly, right? Because you need the air. It's also good if you say have an aquifer down there um, that you know, needs to be fed and because it, you know, you're drawing the water or whatever. So what are some of the bad things about that? So you lose some of the water, right? And something that might be in the water, like nitrate or a pesticide or something like that, right? So that's why we see a lot more problems with these kind of sandy coarse soils with, with, with leaching. So this is then, I'm gonna do it again, but we have the, the, the three forms of water, right? So one is what, what I call then drainage water. So this is what's rapidly being lost due to gravity. Okay, and so um, this is basically not available to the plants at all. Like I said, it's a good thing. The air gets into the, into the soil, but that's all good. Then we have, secondly, we have what's called the plant available water, right? So if, we're, if there's a plant growing in the soil, it will slowly draw the water out of the soil. So I'm simulating that by basically squeezing it out, right? So. That's the plant available water. And today we'll talk about how we measure that, right? And so is a is sponge, is there any water in the left in the sponge? Yeah. yeah, there's still a little bit of water left in the sponge, right? So we call that the unavailable water because it's, there's some water in the sponge or in the soil, but it's so, held, so, held so tightly that the plants can't access it, right? So that's basically, so that water, this plant available water, that's the most, in a way most valuable for, for growing crops. Now here's my other sponge. Okay, let me empty these by the way. So this was my compacted clay sponge, right? Now watch the huge amount of water that's gonna come out of this sponge when I hold that up. Oops, <laughs> right? So why is this? Yeah, it's all, it's all tightly held water in small pores, right? So is it good? There, I mean, there's a lot available for plant growth, but there's no aeration. So the, the roots are very unhappy, right? There's no air in, 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 in the soil. So it's, and it becomes anaerobic, exactly. Anaerobic, no air exchange, no carbon dioxide being lost very bad for growing plants, right? So if you have naturally poorly drained soil, or if you have a soil that has become compacted, like this one, right? You can send it around. You know, you, you see that that clump is very low in organic matter content. It has no aggregates. It only has small pores. So it will behave like this one here, okay? So the ideal soil is sort of the one that's between these two. This one is losing too much water, this one is retaining too much water. You kind of want something that's right in, in between. Okay, so I mean, it makes for a nice little demo and I think maybe Joseph will talk about some other demos that are useful in terms of educating farmers or students, whatever, on, on these basic processes, right? So holding, retaining water in the soil is, is really, really Im an important process, okay? Any questions about that? So remember SpongeBob, especially young people here. All right, so here's basically what we, what I just tried to demonstrate. If we have a sandy soil, like the first sponge, you have a lot of, oops, uh, gravitational water. I'm gonna do it this way. A lot of water is being lost, which is non, no longer available. And then a little bit of water is unavailable, very tightly held. And, but this is the, the water that's most important, okay? but that's for a sandy soil, for a dense clay, the second sponge, very little gravitational water, in our case, basically none. Uh, more plant available water, but also a lot of water 
that's unavailable, that's so tightly held in a small force, it's not available. So the ideal situation is where you have something in between. So a good, uh, you know, loam soil um, is, you know, some gravitational water so that the air can get in, right? Some unavailable water, okay, tightly held, but you have a lot of plant available water, right? Uh, and so that's why those type of soils are the most desirable. If you look at agricultural soils, um, most of them are loams, silt loams, silts. You know, the vast majority of the good agricultural land is that. Sometimes maybe a loamy sand or something like that, but most of them are these intermediate soils. So what you want then is in a soil is to have some small pores for water retention, some very large pores so that the air can get in and exchange, and then some intermediate pores, right? So how do you get that? Well, by having aggregates. So instead of having individual particles, you have ag aggregates of particles. And a typical aggregate actually has a certain, certain hierarchy in it. So here's one crumb, an aggregate crumb, right? Maybe what you see here, like one of these maybe, okay. That's one crumb. And then if you were to take that apart, you'll find that it has, is made up of, of other smaller aggregates and those smaller aggregates are made up of yet smaller aggregates, right? But it gives you then that nice range of pore sizes, large ones for the aeration and, a, and a water transmission, small ones for the retention. And a lot of the biological processes tend to happen in these intermediate uh, uh, pores, okay? And so in a way, the aggregate forms that skeleton that allows for all these processes to occur the water, air exchange, and the, and the biological function. So, and one thing that I want you to kind of think about, so when you look at soil, right, at the one that's going around or whatever, you see those minerals. And what you don't see is the pores between the minerals, but the pores are really where all the action is, right? And so a nice analogy that I like to use is a building, right? So let's take this building, and you have a skeleton, and we're in a room here, right? The room is supported by this building structure, the skeleton. The most important and most interesting thing that's happening in this room is not that structure, it's us. We are the biology in this room, right? We're exchanging, uh, if we were in the soil, we'd be eating each other, by the way. We don't <laughs> wanna do that. Uh, we're just eating the food, but you know, we'd be fighting each other and eating each other and suppressing each other. Uh, but it's the biology that's really important. So, so think of it as a soil, the minerals as being a house or a building, and that the interesting processes, the microbes, the fungi, the, the you know, what other, other animals, I'll talk about that, the action is really happening in the, in the pores, right? And when we, when we develop soil and we till it, we're basically destroying the structure we're collapsing the structure, right? So just imagine that the ceiling would be coming down to here. I'd be a lot less happy if that were the case, <laughs> right? And most of you probably too. All right, so, so that's what's happening. When we till the soil, we lose the organic matter that's important for creating these aggregates. Um, and then the surface becomes more compacted. We often do more tillage. Uh, infiltration decrease, uh, we get erosion, we lose more of the organic matter that's so important for the aggregates, and so we basically have this overall decline. And then we refer to that sometimes as tillage addiction because the only way to kind of overcome this collapse is to kind of fluff it back up again, but you basically are in a vicious cycle. All right, so tillage is very damaging. Any questions? Let's talk a little bit about soil strength and, and compaction. So, you know, we need these aggregates to have a relatively loose soil or a, a low bulk density because it facilitates all these physical processes like infiltration, water transmission. And when we don't have that, we lose that, like that clump that you see there, we start to have runoff. So a lot of the areas that were initially developed for agriculture that were not in these confluence areas, that were, you know, maybe pasture land that was that was being put in crop production, 
this is what happened. And once you have that, once you start to get denser soil, harder soil, the plants don't grow as well, you get erosion and runoff, and then it, it makes it worse. So a lot of land, for example, in the Middle East um, was a, became abandoned after a few decades. So you go now to places like Southern Europe, Italy, or Greece, or Turkey, or places like that, and the soils are very degraded, right? Because they, they became very eroded, and, uh, and it was a huge problem. Okay, this is what it looks like from the top. You can imagine when you have crusts like that, that you, know, you don't get a lot of vegetation, you see plants are having a hard time growing, right? And so, so and this then interacts with the potential for erosion. Let me try to explain that. So when you have soil particles and the soil is saturated with water, is the soil soft or hard? Soft, right? So if you have a very wet soil, you can just push your finger into it. Now if that soil dries out, what happens? It becomes much harder, right? And sometimes when it becomes extremely dry, it becomes loose, right? So uh, if you go to the beach, and you stand right by the water's edge, you can wiggle your, your, your feet and your toes and you can just, it's really soft. And you step back and then the soil becomes very hard. The beach becomes very hard, like on Daytona beach, if you've ever been there. And then when you get you further back, what does the, what does the, the beach look like? It's just loose sand, right? So where do you see the soil moving? At the water's edge, because the water moves this, moves the sand particles, right? Back and forth, right? And that's basically this scenario, which is basically water erosion. On the other side, other end of the beach, the soil is loose. You're sitting there eating your sandwich and then the wind blows. Ah, <laughs> you're eating sand, right? So it's on these extremes. And when you have a lack of aggregates, it's on the extremes where you have the problems. That's where when it's too wet, you get the wind, the water erosion. When it's too dry, you get the wind erosion, right? So there's this interaction between the weather and the, stat, the status of the soil. And if you have good aggregates, you really minimize those impacts. I'm going to skip that one. And that one too. All right. Uh, maybe that one too. Sorry, uh, because I'm looking at the, at the clock a little bit. So... Another component, so we're, we're looking at the sponges and you know how much water the sponge can hold. And so we say, okay, that's great. It, you know, you have that plant available water, but is it really plant available? There's something else that's, that, that's a factor in that. And that's the roots need to be able to access the water, right? So you can have a sponge like this or a soil like this and it has water in it, but if the roots can't grow into it, Right? They can't access it. So you need both a soil that can retain the water, and you need to have a soil that allows the roots to grow. And again, what's the best way to do that? For the structure to be well aggregated. Okay, because if you have aggregates, you have large pores, the roots can get into the large pores, they can push the aggregates to the side, and you get much better rooting and much better uptake right, of, uh, of water and nutrients. So if you have a very compacted soil, you see there's one root that went into the soil. It may be found a zone of weakness, but most of the soil is basically the water and nutrients are not accessed by the roots, right? So it's there, but it's not of any use to the plant, just a little bit here around the root. So this is what you want, right? So you want a combination of good water retention capacity, which you'll see how we measure that in the lab, and good aggregation, but the roots can access it. And you'll see how we measure that in the lab as well. Okay, so here's an example of this very compacted soil, like the one that's going around, and no large pores, the roots can grow into it. Maybe when the soil is very wet, it's a little softer, maybe a little bit of, of growth, but this is, you know, you can see here a healthy soil, you see an earthworm, you see holes there, earthworm channels, uh, you see casts and all that, and the roots will grow very well into that, okay? So it's not only whether the soil can hold the water, but is it also accessible 
to the plants. Okay, so I want to move on to the biological component. Any questions about the physical? Right. <laughs> yes, there are methodologies that are that sort of take the best of both worlds, and the one that's notable is what we call strip village, where you where you do only a little bit of disturbance in right in the row where the seed goes and the, and the rest is undisturbed. It works well with row crop systems. So that's, that's kind of the, um, the best compromise because you know, one of the challenges with, you know, if you've in, intensively tilled the soil for decades, it has become addicted to tillage. It became so compacted that each time you need to fluff it back up. Um, and so if you then go what we call cold turkey into, into no-till, it's going to be a disaster because the soil is so compacted. So strip-till is a way where you say, okay, we're doing a little bit of tillage, but we really minimize the disturbance. And that seems to be a good way, especially for soils that are naturally challenging for no-till. For example, in colder climates, uh, more clay, heavy textured soils, they have a lot more challenges. Okay. Bulk density, yes. So in a way, bulk density, you're correct, is a measurement of the aggregation, right? Of 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 uh, of how what what the pore space is. But absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll talk about some of the the way we measure it later. And bulk density, there's an interesting story around that. So, yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the biological component then. Okay, um, so why is the soil organic matter so important? So it's only a relatively small fraction, maybe two to 5% typically of the soil, but it's, it's such an important fraction uh, because it basically sustains the whole biological system. So in the book, uh, Building Soils for Better Crops, uh, did you get it, guys get a chance to look at that? Um, I think it was a reading assignment, right? So we used uh, uh, three uh, fractions, basically, of the organic matter. And the living, the dead, and the very dead. It's kind of a funny way of expressing it, but it, it, it explains quite well what's really uh, going on. So each of them are important, right? And we'll try to explain that. So the living is what it says, the living, the stuff that's alive, right? So all kinds of organisms, it's a... It's a very rich, I mean, soils are so rich in, in, in biological materials. So bacteria, fungi, nematodes, earthworms, mites, springtails, moles, etc., and plant roots. Plant roots are also alive, and they're all in the soil. And, uh, and this is only a, a small part of it. Um, and what are the roles? Well, they basically make nutrients available. They acquire nutrients. They suppress diseases. They help aggregate the soils. So they basically make the soil a biologically well-functioning system, okay? Um, and it's a, just a very diverse group there. Roots are, so we, roots are the, the plant component and they have a lot of benefits. So anytime you have a root in the soil, it has basically benefits, right? It, it creates pore space, it pumps carbon into the soil, um, you know, sometimes very deep into the soil. Um, it exudes sugars that stimulate the uh, food chain activity. So it basically feeds some, a lot of these organisms in the soil and maybe even a little chemical. So it maybe helps suppress, uh, say, weeds or other organisms. So roots are, are basically a big source of the carbon that goes into the soil. And this is an interesting, how many of you have, have seen this, this picture? Right, it's an interesting picture. Uh, from the Land Institute, uh, it shows you um, a perennial wheat grass that is a prairie grass, and it shows you annual wheat, right? Uh, so, and then it's, you know, uh, during a, a year time period, so uh, uh, quarterly, so September, December, March, June. So you see here 
how deep the rooting system is of the wheatgrass. Even though you don't see a lot above ground, it has a lot of carbon actually below ground, and there's a lot of turnover of those roots as well. So it, it just releases a lot of carbon organic matter. This is the annual wheat. So it was planted in September, so you don't actually see any roots there. And then this is December, so you have a few roots, then it goes to the winter. Yeah, it grows some more roots, and then this is around harvest time. But you see the, the dramatic difference between an annual grass, which is wheat in this case, and a perennial grass. So there's just a lot more carbon and nutrients that are being recycled or cycled in, uh, in a perennial system. And that's why some of these soils naturally were, were so, so healthy and so productive and fertile. Okay, so that's the living part. So it's, it's these organisms, um, earthworms, mites and all that, uh, as well as plant roots being living. So now we're gonna look at the dead. So the dead organic matter, the way you need to look at it is, is, is as, as, as a food source for all these life organisms, right? So it may be uh, fresh manure, it may be uh, crop residue that's being decomposed, um, and it's basically the, the recently dead material. So for us, you know, when you see something like this, this is, you know, for many organisms, this is it's chow time. It's like, you know, we're gonna be eating some great stuff now. This is, this is a, like a juicy hamburger to many organisms in the soil, right? This is a lot of carbon, a lot of nutrients to them uh, that helps them sustain, right? So this fresh organic matter basically feeds the, um, uh, the biology of the soil. So we call it the soil food web. So the ultimate source of the energy is the sun captured through photosynthesis by plants. It may go through an animal, maybe eaten by say a buffalo or, or, a, or a cow or whatever, uh, but it gets deposited, either the plants die off or manure, and then that feeds the whole system where uh, some organisms basically decompose the organic matter, uh, let's say bacteria are involved, but the protozoa eat the bacteria. They release some of the nitrogen. Uh, the nematodes may eat the protozoa. I mean, it's a jungle down there, right? I mean, um, but this basically sustains that whole system. And if you don't have enough uh, organic material going into the system, like I was explaining uh, in my previous lecture, then you diminish all the life in the soil. It makes it less viable. Good, so that was the, so we did the living, the dead, and the very dead is basically the sort of the material that remains after decomposition uh, tends to be um, the lignin, the, 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 the organic material that's very difficult to decompose. Or char, char is also very difficult to decompose. It still is very important because that's basically adds to the ability of the soil to hold on to water and nutrients. So if you have, say, especially with a sandy soil, it doesn't have any natural capacity to hold water and nutrients, but if you have organic matter in the soil, then it does, okay? Um, it provides cation exchange capacity um, it, through chelation. Um, it can hold these, uh, these nutrients. It also holds, um, through the uh, mineral uh, interaction between mineral and organic matter, it what allows the soils to hold on to the organic matter. Okay, so a soil can hold on to a certain amount of organic matter, a clay soil more than a sandy soil. What? Clay soil. Clay soil holds on, can hold on to more organic matter than a sandy soil because of the or organo mineral bonds. Very important topic these days because people talk about carbon farming and taking carbon out of the atmosphere into the soil. So that's that ability of the soil to do that is very important. Okay, so that's what this is. I kind of got ahead of myself. So these strong bonds between organic matter and especially clay and fine silt is really, uh, it's like the capillarity with the water, the ability of the soil to hold on to water and the ability of the soil to hold on to carbon is really very important in terms of the broader ecosystem services. Carbon is also very well held within this very small aggregates because it's basically physically protected. The organisms can't get to it, 
right? Also very important. That's why the clays are much better at storing uh, carbon. Um, and then uh, recently been a lot of interest in char uh, because it's so stable in the soil. So if you char it and put it in the soil, it kind of stays around for several hundred years. Not saying that that's the solution to, some people think it's a solution to the carbon problem, um, but it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, idea. So the amount stores depends on the balance of the gains and the losses. So the soil will, will store uh, carbon, but if you say till it, you lose a lot of carbon, or if you have erosion, you lose a lot of carbon, right? So ideally, you have more carbon going into the soil than, you, than, than it loses, but there's a limit. It has a limited capacity to store uh, carbon the same way it has a limited capacity to store water. Okay, most of our soils have a good opportunity to, to store more carbon. So that's why there's an interest in carbon farming. And uh, Joseph did some analysis that I'll show you tomorrow. Okay, quickly, I'm gonna go through a number of biological processes that are, that are important, sort of just kind of touch, up, touch upon them. So one of them is, is residue uh, breakdown and, and, uh, and uh, incorporation. So we have this, um, this dead organic matter, so it may be residues, it may be manure, uh, you know, just basically fresh organic material, uh, roots, and then all these, a number of these organisms are basically going, getting to work. Once you have some of these organic matter being deposited, you get the shredders out there, you get the, the buriers out there to bring them in, like earthworms. Uh, you get the guys who ingest it, earthworms do actually both. They actually ingest the organic material and then it comes out as, as cast uh, through egestion. Uh, they coat and, and inoculate aggregates. Uh, they support all kinds of uh, enzymatic uh, reactions that basically uh, allows for the decomposition, right? Um, so just a picture, so here's a dung beetle, for example. So the dung beetle loves dung, loves manure, and uh, very important process, um, you know. So, uh, so these are great little workers that basically support these ecosystem processes. Earthworms, of course. Uh, who was the one who studied earthworms very early on? Anybody remember that? What famous scientist? Darwin, Charles Darwin, at the end of his career, uh, even though he was already so accomplished in his early work, he, he decided to study earthworms. Very fascinating. So they're, they're basically great, uh, great uh, organisms. They, uh, they, they make uh, holes in the soil, which is very good. Uh, they create these very stable casts that are basically great aggregates. You see it here, you see it there. Uh, it helps mix the soil, increases the infiltration, and, and helps provide channels for roots, especially if the soil is a little compacted. So these are really great. Uh, you can have too many of them. Uh, that's a problem here in the Northeast where the invasive species, uh, the night crawlers are basically um, uh, taking all the leaf litter and causing some problems in the forest. But in most cases, they're really great uh, organisms. Uh, these are some of the organisms that do the shredding and, uh, and um, uh, the uh, herbivory and basically kind of take this organic matter, maybe leaves, it may be dead plants, it may be manure, manure, and they basically make it more available for decomposition. Okay, so also great guys out there. Uh, nematodes are little worms. Uh, uh, one of the things they tend to have a bad reputation because sometimes they attack plants and then they cause diseases, but most nemat nematodes are basically good guys. Okay, they're part of this food web, and, uh, and so they're, they have very important ecosystem services. There's a whole discipline, you know, people who are specialists in, in nematodes. There's just a lot of variety. Um, so uh, basically the idea is, and, and, you know, our early soil health work involved uh, uh, also a colleague, George Abawi, uh, who's a plant pathologist, and the, the, the idea that if you have a healthy soil with lots of healthy organisms, that it creates kind of a suppressive environment, right? It's kind of like the natural system. You go to places like Kenya and you go to the natural savanna area, you know, everybody eats everybody else, but everybody keeps everybody else in check too. So, no, you know, there's no organism 
it starts to dominate, right? And you need the same in, in the soil. If, if, if the soil is not healthy and there's not a suppressive biology, a pathogen can really take over, right? And you need to have other organisms that keep that pathogen in check. It may be there, but it needs to be kept in check, right? And it's the same like we have with humans in society. We kind of keep each other in a certain amount of checks and balances, all right? Um, so some of these biocontrol uh, mechanisms, so pythium is a serious uh, soil-borne disease, but uh, trichoderma, uh, so pythium is a, is a fungus, trichoderma is, um, oh, my, oh, something, it's like a, a fungus-like, it's something different. And, and, and they can basically suppress the pythium, and there's probably, hundreds of other examples of where one organism keeps the other one in check. And I'm not, uh, admittedly, not the ultimate expert in that. Um, but it's an, a very, uh, what we do see is that when we have healthy soils, we just have less outbreak of diseases. So that brings us to the disease triangle, uh, which is a very important concept in, in pathology. So one is you need to have the pathogen present. Right, so if you have, say, uh, pythium as a, a soil-borne uh, disease, you need to create also an environment where this pathogen will thrive. And so with, say, pythium, it's having less suppressive, you know, having less of other organisms that basically suppress it, but also if the soil is very wet and poorly drained, it tends to thrive. Right? So if you have a, a degraded soil that becomes very compacted like this and it becomes wet, a, a, a disease organism will do much better in that. Okay? So that, yes? For the pathogen part, do you consider as part of this part? I mean, the same issue applies to human <coughs> pathogens, yes. I mean, when we think about... Uh, pathogens in, in so, human pathogens in soils, it probably, I've never really given that a lot of thought, but we do introduce a lot of human pathogens in soil as well. Right. Right. Yeah, that's correct. And, and so if you have a, a, a soil environment that's not suppressive of those human pathogens, it would be the the same thing. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, so, so it's the the presence of the pathogen, the environment that may be created by the interaction of the soil, say aggregation and, and climate, and then of course the host. You know, are you growing a crop that is susceptible to a pathogen? For example, um, beans are susceptible to a lot of pathogens, and you'll you'll see that later when we are in in the lab. Uh, but say corn may be not so susceptible to some of these. So that's really, but the, the idea is, you know, uh, you can manage what you grow, right? And you can manage the environment by, say, creating a very healthy soil. And that way you can also manage the pathogen, okay? So good rotations, maintaining good soil structure, uh, ma maintaining a lot of biological di uh, uh, diversity allows you to suppress these pathogens and in many cases reduce the interventions, the, the spraying pesticides or things like that. Okay, so another important biological process is basically making nutrients available, right? So nutrients in the soil primarily are in organic matter, unless you apply it as a fertilizer, and then these basically are being transformed uh, and then the nutrients are being made available, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or, or whatever. And that process is called mineralization. Um, but you can also have a process that's called immobilization, where the nutrients are being drawn into the organic matter. Okay? Uh, so that's another uh, important process. Also, biological nitrogen. Biological nitrogen. That's another one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's in, in another slide. Yeah. Okay, so functional redundancy. So these are in, in important uh, processes, but having a rich biological environment provides that functional uh, re redundancy, which makes it more robust and resilient. 
Uh, so aggregation, I already kind of talked about that, and another uh, very important uh, biological process. So if you don't have um, a, bi a, a strong biological system, you don't have a good physical environment either because you don't get the aggregations either through the roots or through the earthworms or organisms like that. Uh, plant growth uh, uh, promotion, it's a fairly new area um, where basically, so for example, rhizobacteria that help promote plant growth. You know, so the plants and the other organisms in the soil, whether it's bacteria or fungi or whatever, they tend to interact in a positive way, certainly in a healthy soil and environment. And also tends to be very uh, important for inducing resistance to especially diseases. Um, and then the other component is that when we have a better aggregated soil, we also protect the carbon much better, okay? Because the, we allow the carbon to get into the aggregates and being protected there, right? And so if we build healthier soils, we find that we can build up the carbon levels in the soil and then we can protect that carbon much better. All right, so here's just a picture, you know, so, so some of the, the, the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, hyphae, uh, the protection of the carbon in the microaggregates and things like that, okay? All right, so um, I'm not gonna talk much about the, the chemical uh, processes in the soil because that's most of you, I think, are more familiar with that. Um, so it's the availability of phosphorus, potassium, the pH, uh, CEC, things like that. Um, but, uh, so nutrient deficiencies, but also acidity and alkalinity, very important. You know, low pH is a real problem. Too, too high pH, typically less, but uh, also a problem. Phytotoxicity, uh, where you may have, say, high um, lead levels or cadmium levels or something like that in the soil, especially in urban environments. Uh, ah, there you go, human contaminants. Um, uh, salinity, sodicity. So this, you know, sodicity creates a lot of problems with very compacted soils and things like that. Um, so what's maybe kind of ties the the chemical with the physical and the biological is that the the nutrients may be in the soil, but it's still they still need to get from the soil to the plant, right? It's the same with the water. Like I said. You, the soil may hold water, but the roots, they maybe need to be uh, accessing it. So it's the same thing with the chemistry. So if you do a soil analysis, traditional soil analysis, and you measure the phosphorus, the potassium content, and the pH and all that, it may be in the soil, but can it be effectively used by the plants? Well, for that, you need to have good aggregation, you need to have roots grow and be able to access those nutrients. You need to have uh, diffusion and mass flow of, of solution from the soil with the nutrients. Uh, like I said, the roots need to be able to, to uh, pro pro proliferate. There needs to be good transport of the nutrients into the plant. Um, you may be need to have some help, like for example, mycorrhizal fungi help with the acquisition of phosphorus in the, in the soil and make in the roots in a way that make the roots more effective. So the point here is, that yes, we know how to measure phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and all that, all right, but that's not the entire story. It also needs to be accessible to the plants uh, through these biological and physical processes, right? So again, it's not only about the chemistry, it's about all three of those, physics, physics biology, and chemistry, all right? And um, this is my last slide, because I just want to, uh, I don't know whether some of you work more in, in, in urban environments or, or not, um, but we tend to focus on agricultural soils, but urban soils are also important for a couple of reasons. One is that most people live in an urban environment and increasingly so, all right? And soils in urban environments are also important, right? When you see a tree, maybe, you know, go drive 10 miles out of town, you see a tree, so, oh, that's a nice tree, right? If you go to the Upper East Side in New York and you see a nice tree, that tree is worth a lot more than the tree that's, you know, in Lansing, you know, near my house. Uh, so the, the natural environment, which includes the soil, 
is more valuable in urban uh, environments, right? Because more people get to enjoy it. And you know, we've had um, we've had many and many uh, um, urban areas where the environment basically has been destroyed, and a lot of people live in really suboptimal uh, in environments. And there's a lot of um, uh, in, injustice and, 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 and inequity around that. <clears throat> but these are some of the problems that you see in urban soils. I mean, it, look what it looks like. So very high bulk density, very dense soil, no aggregation. Typically very low organic matter, very poor structure. A lot of times very high pH. Why is that? It's a lot of concrete in, uh, in urban areas. Low water holding capacity, uh, very hard soil, uh, no aggregate stability, the roots can't grow. It, your typical urban tree lives in a terrible environment, right? Very compacted, often, you know, very small uh, area. So, um, and then, you know, typically microbial biomass and activity, are very diminished, not only maybe because of the pH, a lot of times there's contaminants in the soil in urban areas. So we really need to, you know, when we think about soil health, uh, we tend to have this natural affinity towards agricultural soils, maybe some natural soils, but in the urban environments, uh, even though there's much less soil, it's so important because of the high populations. Okay, and that was my last slide. So I think we did okay, didn't we, Joseph? Are you, did I, did I pass? All right. Any questions? Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.